Welcome to all of you here in the sanctuary, to those of you watching at home. Today is a day that we designated as what we called our grand reopening here at St. John's, and yet because of the Delta variant, our welcome has necessarily narrowed. For those of you in the sanctuary and those of you at home, you may know that in order to be in the sanctuary, we require vaccination and masks. I'm not sure how those two public health things got so politicized that people are dying because of it. And they're making the worst mistake of their lives and expressing their regrets on their deathbeds. How can we as people of faith proclaim that Jesus would wear a mask and Jesus would get a vaccine? Now, can I speak for Jesus? No, but I do know the scriptures and I do know thousands of years of church history. And I can tell you that when we take care of ourselves and we take care of our neighbors, we create better communities for everyone. And here today, we finally have our children back in worship. We have our children back in our programming. And we've made decisions to keep our children safe. Can I get an amen? They can't get vaccinated depending on their age. So what do we do? We get vaccinated, unless there is an exception. Those are few and far between, but there are some and we wear our masks because it keeps our children safe. Now, I wish that we could, in a perfect world, go back to where we were before the pandemic, but that's not where we are. The Delta variant has caused some changes. But I'm here today to tell you that we are moving in the right direction. As a church, we are moving in the right direction to reopen, to continue to live into our ministries and our programs, and most importantly, we never ever gave up. Can I get an amen? We never missed a meal at the largest table. We continued our ministry and our programming to the best of our ability. And today we're gonna celebrate that and we're gonna turn a page. We're gonna turn a page into the next generation of what we're doing here at St. John's. So you're gonna hear not one but two songs today from St. John's Gospel Choir. I, this is going to make me emotional. Can I get an amen and a round of applause for the Gospel Choir? Do you know how hard it is? Do you know how hard it is for a choir to keep singing during a pandemic when they can't literally keep singing? So what did they do? They actually got together on Zoom. Now again, if you've ever done this, tried to even have a conference call on Zoom, if you ever tried to sing on Zoom, you know that nothing syncs up and it gets really hard. So what did the choir do? Did they give up? No. 
What they did during the winter, when they couldn't practice in person and nothing was working, they wrote an original song. Some of you have seen those videos. We've done a couple of videos. So I just want to say, number one, a word of thanks to our choir director, Amber. And I want to say a word of thanks to David, our pianist and technological wizard, who made it possible for this choir not only to persist, but to succeed. And so today you're gonna to hear live the original song that they wrote during the winter, during the pandemic. It's their words, it's their music, and I hope that you'll enjoy it. So that's number one. Secondly, today is the official launch of St. John's Community Choir. We are broadening our perspective in terms of what our choir can be, our vision for our choir. Can I get another round of applause for what our vision of our choir can be? So invite your friends, invite your neighbors, we're gonna keep practicing and moving forward. I wanna share some congratulations as well because today we are turning the page. Today's message is about hope and restoration and moving forward. I wanna thank Pastor Mary. I don't know if she's here in the sanctuary. She did a, a grant presentation this week. If you'll give her a round of applause in Worthington. We are trying to do new things to raise funds through the Columbus Beacon of Hope Foundation to fund our largest table ministry. If you're on the board of the Columbus Beacon of Hope Foundation, will you stand for a moment? Moment, let folks see who you are. These are the folks to talk to if you would like to make a gift to the Columbus Beacon of Hope Foundation to raise money to fund meals and supplies for our homeless and marginally housed neighbors through our largest table program. I also want to congratulate um, Amber, our choir director and a member of our worship team who is a new member of the Capital University faculty. She's going to start teaching this fall. And again, there are many more congratulations and things to share, but those are just a couple of things. I just wanna share with you that we're turning a page, that so many of you, despite the hardships of this last year and a half, you have not given up. In the depths of everything, you said, we're gonna persist, most importantly, we're gonna walk together, and we're gonna do, we're just gonna keep going. So, we've got the gospel choir for you today. I see members of our kickball team here today. If you're on the kickball team, would you please stand and um, receive a round of applause. Brittany is here, our team captain. This year we got to play kickball again. Thank you, they led the kickball team. Our largest table, if you've served at the largest table during the pandemic, would you please stand and be recognized? I wanna give these people a round of applause who made sure that these meals continued. If you've been a member of the Wednesday class, we've had to do a lot of that by Zoom. If you've been a member of the Wednesday class, would you stand and please be recognized? These are also people who did not give up. They continued studying and journeying together. Thank you. If you are one of our care callers, if you've been doing the care calling ministry, would you raise your hands high? You've done a ton of work during this pandemic. As a special thank you to Cindy today, she's gonna like my sermon, it's one of her favorites, so yes. That's because it's a theology of restoration. And then finally, if you have been part of a gathering, a group, a worship service, a group gathering, a porch visit, anything having to do with this church the last year and a half, would you please stand and receive a round of applause? That means all of you, because you're here today. And that means those of you at home as well. So we want to give everyone a round of applause as we start. We have a very special service for you today, a lot of special music, but we first wanted to start with a word of celebration because as we enter into this space, as we get ready to greet each other and hear litany and music and sermon and more, we are also here today to celebrate the marriage of Amanda and Danielle, who were married off-site. Yes, we can give them a round of applause. There'll be a special litany. Now we're gonna have to do it a little differently because of the pandemic so I'll be inviting them up here after the sermon and all of that and we'll do that but we also want to celebrate the many many happy things that have happened during this time that has been so challenging for so many but people have gotten married people have had babies we've had so many things to celebrate and so few opportunities to do that so today we're going to celebrate together and we invite you all into that journey so may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all Please greet one another with the peace of God and words of welcome as you are comfortable during the pandemic.
Actually, you can just start it. Please join me in the call to worship. To take the clay of our lives and shape disciples, God calls us to the potter's house. To receive and mend those who are broken from life experiences, God calls us to the potter's house. To love and heal those who are wounded by war, pandemic, and plague, God calls us to the potter's house. To shelter all who are outcast and heavenly burdened, God calls us to the potter's house. Let us enter this place of transformation and worship our God.
A reading from the book of Psalms, chapter 139. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts. O oh God, how vast is the sum of them. I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Our second reading today is taken from the prophet Jeremiah from chapter 18, select verses from the passage that's from 1 through 11. It's a special passage today because it leads us into the event that we're celebrating today, which is a turning of the page, a restoration, a rebirth of our church, our ministries, our programs, and most importantly, our people. And the prophet wrote this, that wor the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, come. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there the potter was working at his wheel. The vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel as seemed good to him. Then the words of the Lord came to me. Can I not do with you, O house of Israel, just as this potter has done, says the Lord? Just like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Here ends the reading. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning to the kids who are with us today. Some new faces, which is always exciting. So who has ever played with Play-Doh? I see lots of hands up. You know Play-Doh's been around for 65 years? That's a long time, and so several generations have played with Play-Doh. It's one of my favorite things to use, both in the nursery and in Holy Moly, because while it's colorful, it has that new Play-Doh smell, kind of like the new car smell, right? It's not messy. You can make anything with it, and it's really inexpensive. So one of my favorite things. And every time, oh, this is brand new too. It's like <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's it's like pulling this the the plastic off of your new device or your new phone, right? It gives you just kind of this really satisfying feeling. Yes, it's awesome. Every time I play with Plato, I think about this part of scripture where God is talking to the prophet Jeremiah, and Jeremiah is saying, I had this message from God, this vision from God, and God was the potter, or the one who made the clay, played with the clay, and we are the pottery, we are the Play-Doh. And so I imagine God refining us and, and smoothing out our rough edges and making us look good, then all of a sudden, we do something that makes God go, oh. God smushes it to the ground, starts over again, and rebuilds over and over again. And that has always been one of my images of what grace looks like, this idea of rebuilding, reforming, softening those edges, and just working us from the moment we're born until the moment we leave the earth. 
So that is the message today, this refining work of God. I'll leave my Play-Doh up here so you can look at that. All right, lots of kids today. Let's pray, and then I'll give you some directions. One, two, three. Dear God, thank you for loving us, no matter what we do. Thank you for being there to reform and reshape us. Help us to do your work in your world. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you are coming back to Holy Moly, you can follow me. I do need a parent to come as well to sign in. Thanks, everybody. We picked that song for today because God is still rolling stones, right? Can I get an amen? I don't care what impediment is in your life, God is still rolling stones. And we're here today, the message is don't give up, hold on. You'll hear this more, hold on, stay strong, don't give up, keep your hope. Let us pray. 
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O God, our strength, our redeemer, and our hope. Amen. Well, today does mark a turning point for our congregation, a time to turn the page in our life together as we continue to reopen carefully, as we continue our programming and our ministries to the best of our ability amidst this pandemic. I invite those of you watching at home, if it's safe for you to come and attend in person, I invite you to do so, because those who are here will tell you that there's nothing like being in this majestic space. That said, we're gonna continue to broadcast online indefinitely, because many people are watching us. You know, we look at, at our viewing numbers from Sunday versus Wednesday, you would be surprised at how many people watch us on Sunday afternoon, Monday morning, Tuesday night, Wednesday noon. We're reaching more and more people through the power of Facebook Live. So can I give a thank you to our AV team who made that possible? There are many, many ways in which we are turning the page here. And even though we're still living in the midst of this pandemic, we have a message of hope and we have a message of redemption to share with our world that we think can make this a better journey for everyone. But these past, whatever it is, year and a half, is it 17 months, 19 months? How many of you lost track of the pandemic, right? Did it start in January or February or March 2020? But throughout these months, we constantly talk about recalculating in all kinds of ways. We talk about pivoting, starting over, doing things anew, et cetera. But I keep going back to that very familiar metaphor of recalculating. How many of you have GPS units or Siri or your phone, something in your car that lets you know where you're supposed to go? And if you make a wrong turn, it just tells you how to turn around. Sometimes it tells you to make a U-turn where you can't, right? So it's not perfect. But many of us are familiar with that. And it's a voice that directs us to our intended destination, even though we've made a wrong turn. And over and over again, we're redirected and redirected and redirected. And I kept thinking that this pandemic, if nothing else, has taught us that life is about recalculating, that it is in recalculating that we find our ultimate destiny. It's not whether we actually made it to our destination right the first time, right? How many of you made it right the first time? Oh, my husband might raise his hand. Yeah, he's an engineer, so he's, he's like every time. Right? But most of us, right, make a wrong turn somewhere along the way. And we have to recalculate. We have to find a new way forward. And this pandemic has reminded us of that. But in today's reading, the prophet Jeremiah wondered if the people of Israel could make it to the metaphor of the potter's house, if they could recalculate in life with the help of God, the master potter. And it says in verses 1 through 2 of Jeremiah chapter 18, it says, The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Come, go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So Jeremiah followed a dirt road across a dry riverbed and found the potter working at his wheel. And in verse 4, it goes on and said, The vessel the potter was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand. And the potter reworked it into another vessel as seemed good to him. And in that moment, Jeremiah realized that the work of the potter was an illustration of how God was shaping the people of Israel. In verse 6, the clay in the potter's hand was like Israel in God's hand. Now, I share this with you because so often we don't know Scripture, and we only hear it in news clips from people who proclaim to know it and are just kind of getting TV sound bites. So I want to share with you this image of the potter. It's one of the best-known images in all of Scripture. How many of you have heard it before? We try and touch on it every year or two because it is so familiar, and yet it is often misused. Well, this well-known image raises one of the most important theological tensions and issues in Scripture. It's the tension between the divine sovereign and human freedom. It's the tension between God's work in the world and human free will. Isn't that exactly where we are in this pandemic, right? The tension between God's work in this world and human free will. 
It's the tension caused by something we cause, call the theodicy problem. If God is all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-loving, why is there evil in the world? Why do good things happen to bad people? That is a question that persists in every generation of church. And I wish I had a great answer for you this morning. I wish I could offer more than thousands of years of scriptural interpretation and profound theologians who all wrestled with it. In some ways, it brought me comfort when I went to seminary because I kind of wanted an answer to that question. And so Hank is laughing. I really wanted an answer to that question. What I really found was that in thousands of years of theologians, there really were lots of answers to that question. And that gave me comfort because I realized that's one of the fundamental struggles in our life is the tension between God's work in the world and our human free will. I think of brilliant but hard to understand philosophers like Soren Kierkegaard. Anyone remember Kierkegaard? Yeah, we got a, our theologians are raising their hands. And his many books about the difference between God's eminence being here with us in the world and God's transcendence being beyond us in the world. I wish today I could offer more than some of these well-reasoned theological remarks about human will and intention and how we are all co-creating with God at any given moment. But many of you tell me that's boring and it puts you to sleep in the sermon and you don't understand it. And I get that, I really do. Because it's hard to understand and it's hard to address in a small period of time. So with a hat tip to Cindy Kilbane, where Cindy, gotta raise your hand so everyone knows, with a hat tip to Cindy Kilbane, Today, we are going to talk about one of her absolute favorite topics. And if I don't hit it every year or two, I, Cindy, it's the only time maybe she'll mention it to me about a sermon if I don't talk about her favorite topic. And I share this because, not because I actually take requests, because I kind of don't, but I do. <laughs> um, but what I appreciate about her reminder about this theological interpretation of God's work in the world is it's one that makes sense to us. It's redemptive, it's restorative. Some of you, if you've been here before, you've probably heard over the last couple of years this topic, but if you're new to us, if you're watching online, if you're new to us, you may never have heard about this before. And we wanted to share it with you on this very special Sunday where we're talking about redemption and hope. Because Cindy liked this because it helps us understand that many of us are not here today or watching online because we have it all together. We're here because we don't. Can I get an amen? We're here because we're hurting, we're wondering, we, f we feel a tension between what's happening in the world and our role in it. So, Cindy helped me understand as I went through this that life is like something, you'll see the word in a few minutes, life is like a Japanese art that's called kintsukuroi or kintsugi. It's got a couple of different names. In Japan, there are several different words sometimes for the same thing. But I'm gonna explain it first before I share a, a quick video with you that explains it quite well. But I'm gonna present it in this way. How many of you have felt broken at some point in life? Yeah, raise your hands if you feel comfortable, many of you. It's that feeling that God, our creator, made you, but somehow along the way you got broken, and maybe over and over. Perhaps it happened early in life, in an abusive and dysfunctional family of origin or other kinds of abuse during childhood. Perhaps later in life you lost a loved one, or you lost a job or suffered a pay cut, especially during this pandemic. I can't tell you how many people were negatively impacted by this pandemic, but they wanted to pretend that everything was okay. They didn't want anyone to know how much they were suffering. Perhaps you sensed at some point that you had a drinking or other problem that got worse, especially during the pandemic, but you were too embarrassed to ask for help. Perhaps your relationship or your marriage that began in intimacy and anticipation is now ending in alienation and anger and there are kids involved and it's hard. Perhaps you were broken because of a cancer diagnosis or a sick child or something else. Perhaps 
It's the continued uncertainty and fear caused by this pandemic and its huge health, economic, and societal toll. Did you know I was just reading a bunch of this stuff yesterday? I want to just share this with you. Because I don't really want to talk about the pandemic every week. I'd prefer not to, but it's the world we're living in. Did you know that right now today, I just read this article yesterday, did you know that anxiety about the pandemic is as high as it was when it first started? Did you know that? Many of you have been, how many of you have been re-triggered by this Delta variant and all that stuff? So they've done studies and anxiety is as high as it's ever been because of this pandemic. Dr. Mashika Roberts, who's director of Columbus Public Health, I served with her on the Middle Ohio Food Bank Board, and she actually put an op-ed in the paper yesterday. She wrote, consider that in the last four weeks, the case rate of, of COVID has quadrupled and now stands at 115 cases per 100,000 in, um, in Franklin County. The Franklin County positivity rate is three times what it was last month. Now, unvaccinated people are at the greatest risk of um, getting COVID and giving it to others, she reports. There is still some uncertainty about it, but it's why we've had to move to vaccination and mask requirements for attending in person. And it's why many of you are watching at home because there's still some uncertainty. Maybe you have a health issue or you fall into a high risk category if not being able to be vaccinated, so you're not able to be with us just yet. But I share all of that because we're living in the midst of a time in which life is breaking in which the pandemic is breaking many people in life. How many of you have been challenged the past 18 months by this pandemic and broken in some way? Yeah, many of you. Well, that's just a brief list of the ways in which life can break us and how often we deny it because we, want, we don't want people to know we're embarrassed or ashamed. We would rather disguise the cracks in our being than acknowledge that we need some holy repair. And that's where Cindy reminds us that Kintsukuroi comes in. It is a Japanese art form of repairing broken pottery with gold. The artist takes the broken pottery and restores it with golden repair. In this art form, the artists see opportunities in the broken pieces of the precious pottery. I think about that when people come to me with the challenges they're facing in life. I see opportunity in that. I see opportunity for restoration and hope. But with the Japanese artists, they mix a lacquer resin with powdered gold, and they use the mixture to put the broken pieces of the precious pottery back together. What they end up with is like this picture. It's a pot with cracks in it, but the cracks are filled with gold. So instead of hiding or disguising, <clears throat> pardon me, the breakage, Kintsukuri asserts, this is because I was singing. Hang on just a second. I'm going to go off stage, but you can still hear me. Grab my water. Come on back. Anyone else need a drink of water in this hot sanctuary? It's a good thing I'm not in the theater. <laughs> See, you all are laughing. You have a sense of humor. That's great. Who wants a perfect pastor, right? That's not going to work, right? I'm going to take another drink of water. We really don't need that. It was probably a God thing to remind us that none of us are perfect. But... Instead of hiding or disguising the breakage, the repairs become part of the unique history of the piece. And this restorative process not only creates a gorgeous piece of artwork, but it actually increases the value of the pottery. So I wanted to share with you a short video today that does a much better job than I can of rooting this in theology and practice. In movies or TV, whenever one character says to another character, can't we just go back to the way 
things used to be. It's usually a sign on the part of the writers that that character has yet to face up either to reality or to themselves. The cliché is offered up as a solution. Some trauma has passed. Parties that were enraged or hurt or mistaken want to forgive or heal or apologize. They want the bad times to give way to good times. But only on the pretense, the false pretense, that the bad times never happen. This is a kind of red herring of reconciliation. We know that trauma can be repressed, but it can't be erased. Lasting reconciliation is achieved by emotional self-awareness, by embracing the change agents of trauma, how they irreversibly reorganize elements of personality, identity, and social reality. This idea, the idea of embracing our wounds, our brokenness, is manifested quite poetically in the Japanese mending practice of kintsugi, literally meaning golden joinery. Kintsugi is the art of fixing broken pottery with lacquer resin dusted or mixed with powdered gold. Asian cultures have a long history in lacquerware, though it matured into a sophisticated art in the Chinese Shang Dynasty. The earliest discovered lacquered object dates to the Neolithic Hamudu culture in the 5th millennium BC. Older than the Earth itself, according to young Earth creationists. Pretty impressive. Could be alien. The various delicate arts of lacquerware ramified and expanded down millenniums and cultures. The story of Kintsugi reportedly begins in the 15th century with the Japanese military commander. The story goes that famous shogun Ashikaga Yoshimasa broke one of his prized Chinese tea bowls. So he sent the item back to China for repair. What he got in return was his bowl mended with bulky and ugly metal staples. Dismayed, Yoshimasa prompted Japanese craftsmen to search for a more aesthetic means of repair. The art of kintsugi became famous for turning broken objects into pieces more beautiful than the original product. There are even rumors of people breaking their own possessions on purpose so that they can be mended using this lovely technique. The philosophy here follows from a broader Japanese aesthetic called wabi-sabi that finds beauty not in traditional Western ideals of symmetry or geometry, but in Buddhist concepts of impermanence and imperfection. The fractures on a ceramic bowl don't represent the end of that object's life, but rather an essential moment in its history. The flaws of its shape aren't hidden from inspection, but emblazoned with golden significance. Maybe Hemingway had Kintsugi on his mind when he wrote that famous line from A Farewell to Arms. The world breaks everyone, and afterward, many are strong in the broken places. The amazing art of Kintsugi, a fading art like so many handcrafts, symbolizes the truth that repair requires transformation, that the pristine is less beautiful than the broken, and that the shape of us is impossible to see until it's fractured, until a wound like a crack runs its length. Hey everybody, thanks for watching. Kintsugi is just another example of the- Did you say how imperfection, or perfection is less valuable than imperfection? Does that give you some encouragement? that you don't have to be perfect in this world. You don't have to handle this pandemic or what life is throwing you right now perfectly. You just have to be you. This theology that has been explained in the video is a theology of restoration. And it's a theology that says that while we can't explain why bad things happen to good people or why there is evil in the world or why we've been living through this global pandemic for a year and a half, we can proclaim that God, without fail, God fills the broken places in our beings with the gift of the Holy Spirit, making us stronger and more beautiful in the broken places if only we will allow God into our very being. An author named Christy Bartlett wrote a book in which, about this aesthetic in which she said in this art form, not only is there no attempt to hide the damage, but the repair is literally illuminated. So just think about that for a minute. The repair is literally illuminated. The repair itself shines. We can share more light in this world through our brokenness and restoration than if we were perfect to start with. 
I mean, everyone has cracks and breaks in their lives, and everyone has been shattered by some destructive experience. We just don't know what that is in people's lives sometimes. And these restored ceramics inspire us to show compassionate sensitivity to the broken people around us and compassionate sensitivity to ourselves as well. Well, several decades ago, just 10 days after his son was killed in a car accident, the Reverend William Sloan Coffin delivered a sermon to his congregation at the famed Riverside Church in New York City. It's a UCC church. And he said, as almost all of you know, a week ago last Monday night, driving in a terrible storm, my 24-year-old son, Alexander, who enjoyed beating his old man at every game and in every race, my son beat his father to the grave. Among the healing flood of letters that Reverend Coffin received following his son's death was a letter that revised that Hemingway quote, and someone was just trying to give a personal message to the grieving pastor. And they said from Hemingway, the world breaks everyone, and then some become strong in the broken places. And Coffin continued in his sermon, he said, my own broken heart is mending. And he said, largely thanks to you, my dear parishioners, if in the last week I have relearned anything it is that love only begets love. And it not only begets love, it transmits strength. Love not only begets love, it transmits strength. The wonder of Kintsukuroi theology is this kind of a theology. It's what resonated with Cindy, one of our congregation's care callers, the people who were checking in with our congregation during this pandemic. We couldn't always make things better. But by sharing love, we could transmit strength, holy strength. William Sloan Coffin discovered for himself that when a terrible tragedy broke him, the Christian community stepped in to fill him with love and strength. How many of you have felt like that during the pandemic? that the Christian community has stepped in for you in some way to help fill you with love and strength. And some of the strongest and most beautiful Christians around are those who have broken cracks in their being, cracks that are now filled with spiritual gold. Extraordinary power enters us when we discover that something is missing in our lives and we ask God for help and restoration. And one only need ask God to be filled with that golden spiritual power, forgiveness, redemption, and restoration. It's like Leonard Cohen said, forget your perfect offering. There is a crack in everything. That is how the light gets in. So let us not deny, disguise, or hide our brokenness, even as we continue to wrestle with living forward into this next season. Every one of us has gaps and cracks. So instead, let's allow the light of Christ to fill us up. Let's allow the power of Christ to make us beautiful, strong, and whole as we answer God's call to light the path to healing and redemption for our broken world. Our gospel choir is going to help us do this, and I invite you to stand up as they sing to you their offering from their brokenness during the pandemic, when they literally couldn't sing together, so they wrote together. And they took this theology, they took this theme and wrote a song called Let Love Turn On Your Light. Thank you. 
a song that the gospel choir wrote together while we were on quarantine, while we couldn't be with each other. And the message that we all got together with and decided to put out here was to let love turn on your light. So if you know the words, you can sing along. And you guys have seen this music video a few times, so thank you to everyone who participated in that. Thank you to everyone who helped write this song. And now, here we go, y'all. Now I'm gonna need a balloon up here. Someone wanna give me their balloon? Someone have two, thank you. If you're watching at home, you may not have been able to see this. We had a special surprise for the congregation, right? Because we're turning a page here at St. John's. We are ending 
this season of pivoting and readjusting, and we are beginning anew, and we invite you all to join us on the journey. We're really excited about where we're going. Now, we do have a time for offering in our service, and we invite you to make your offering in a moment silently. Most gracious God, you provide for us in ways that we do not always recognize. Sometimes it's as simple as a purple balloon. In this moment, we pause to express our gratitude for your provisions. We accept this invitation to offer our gifts as an opportunity to say thank you for many blessings. So you're invited to leave your offering. We've had to do this a little differently because of the pandemic. You're invited to leave your offering in uh, one of the offering plates in the back. You're invited to give online. Um, there is a giving kiosk as well. There are many ways to give. Let's just take a moment and give thanks. us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. And now I'm going to invite Danielle and Amanda and Gavin to come forward. Now normally I would be, uh, uh, because of the mass situation in Delta, this we're going to do it a little bit differently. I'm going to ask them to come down front to the cha chancel. I'm going to stay up here so I can stay on my microphone so you all can hear the words, and they can stay safe, and we can also keep Gavin safe, okay? So Danielle and Amanda were married on July 17th. Yep. On July 17th. And uh, we are here to, um, as a congregation, um, affirm and bless their wedding. So this is not in place of the wedding. These are not necessarily the wedding vows, but it is an opportunity in the context of the life of our church to reaffirm their promises to each other. So it's not the wedding, but, and I can't be down there with you in order to keep everybody safe, especially keep Gavin safe, um, and to not put the mask on over the microphone. But one thing we have learned how to do here at St. John's is to recalculate and to do it as a congregation. So um, we will start by um, saying some, I'm hoping all the words will come up on the screen here, that Danielle and Amanda have given themselves to each other as wife and wife according to the laws of the state of Ohio. They are here to declare their love for one another and to receive upon their marriage the blessing of this church and the continued blessing of God upon their union. Will the congregation please rise as you are able in support of this couple? Do you as people of God pledge your support and encouragement to the covenant commitment that Danielle and Amanda are making together? If so, please say, we do. Please be seated. Let us pray. God of our mothers and of our fathers, hear our pledges encouraging and supporting this union of Amanda and Danielle. Bless us as we offer our prayerful and loving support to their marriage. Bless them as they pledge their lives to each other. With faith in you and in each other, may this couple always bear witness to the reality of the love to which we witness this day. May their love continue to grow and may it be a true reflection of your love for us all. Through Jesus Christ, amen. 
Now, Danielle and Amanda, we are today asking you to reaffirm your promises to each other. So you've already taken your wedding vows, but if you'll please face each other and join hands. And maybe Gavin, since we're staying safe, maybe why don't you come down and do the pastor role? Like put your hand on there. Mm -hmm. Practice, right? All right, now when the time comes, I'm gonna have you put the hand on the rings, okay? But we're not there yet. All right, good, we're good to go. All right, now Danielle, you have given yourself, Amanda, to be her wife. Do you reaffirm your promise today to love and sustain her in the covenant of marriage, in sickness and in health, in plenty and in want, in joy and in sorrow, as long as you both shall live? If so, please respond by saying, I do. I do. And then Amanda, you have given yourself to Danielle to be her wife. Do you today reaffirm your promise to love and sustain her in the covenant of marriage, in sickness and in health, in plenty and in want, in joy and in sorrow, as long as you both shall live? If so, please respond by saying, I do. I do. Now, this is your job, Gavin. If you'll please put a hand on their rings, so they'll have to get their hands close together, but put your hand on their rings. All right. And I'll say, through Gavin, their child, Almighty God, bless the wearing of these rings to be symbols of the covenant promises that they have given of themselves to each other through Jesus Christ. Amen. And those whom God has joined together, this family, not just this couple, but this family, let no one separate. Amanda and Danielle, you are wife and wife, and with Gavin, your family. You are together as a family with the blessing of Christ Church. Help each other, be united, live in peace. The blessing, the God of love and harmony be with you always. And as we end this particular litany, y'all are going to be invited to a reception after uh, church today. But as we end this litany, I'm going to say a special blessing. So Gavin, you've, you've got your hand on their rings, right, for the special blessing. All right, here we go. And I'm going to ask, can you see those words, Gavin? All right, can you help me say this? It's a blessing on their wedding, all right? So I've got the mic, but you say it as loud as you can, all right? The grace of Christ attend you. The love of God surround you. The Holy Spirit keep you, that you may grow in holy love, find delight in each other always, and remain faithful until your life's end. Amen. Would you all please rise and give Gavin a round of applause and give the couple a round of applause. Now, when we, when we stay, stay standing, because we're going to have some special songs for you, and then we have a special reception in the back, I invite you to all wear your mask to keep you having safe, but wear your mask, congratulate the couple, and thank you all for being here today. We're really excited to be turning a page here at St. John's. Thank you to those of you watching at home, and here's some special music.
How's that? Oh, geez. Like I said, it's a good thing I'm not in the theater. Oh, my goodness. But today is not about being perfect, right? If anything, it's about being imperfect. It's about owning those imperfections, restoring ourselves and each other through our love for each other, our love for Christ, and most importantly, our call to serve this world. As you leave from here today, please remember the special reception in the back. Thank you for all for being here today. Who blew up the balloons and who were the kids who distributed the balloons? Can we give them a round of applause? Thank you to all of our kids who made today so special. We really, really appreciate it, and we're really looking forward to this, what's coming this fall and what's coming at St. John's. So as you leave from here today and go forward into the week ahead, as our kids return to school, as they try and navigate a way that sometimes the parents haven't quite figured out yet either, may God bless all of you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God look upon you with kindness and give you peace while you go forth to live the gospel fully restored by the light of Christ. Thanks be to God. Enjoy, we are family, and join us for the reception in the back. Thanks be to God. <laughs>